Hello, and welcome to another episode of Making Action Happen. I'm Brian McCain. And now this week, Sarah's out sick. I'm not hiding her anywhere. She's not hiding from this, but she uh, she caught a bad cold because our kids are back in school, and it finally did that whole circle through the, the school kids and back to the parents, so she's out. But she should be back next week. Um, first, I, I just want to do a plug for our annual meeting. It's going to be October 5th and 6th. If you do not know about it, want to know more about it, just go to action22.org. All the information's there. It's actually going to be up in Colorado Springs. We're hosting it with UCCS at the Cybersecurity Center that they have. And then our reception will be at the Ent Performing Arts Building at UCCS. But check it out, action22.org. Again, if you have any questions about it, um, feel free to shoot me an email at show at action22.org. So... We have a returning guest today, um, Representative Ty Winter. Um, he co- he's coming in, stopping by. He's in Pueblo for a meeting, I, I believe, that you never go to meetings, right? Yeah, that, <laughs> like that's, what it seems, that's what it seems like. <laughs> it's been a lot of this summer, and thank you for having me on. It's always good to come up to Action 22. You guys are great partners for uh, Southern and Southeastern Colorado, and we appreciate all you do in advocating for our constituents. No, I, and we appreciate everything you're doing. You know, you kind of took this on three years ago, I think, when you first started running, two um, years? Yeah, right, yeah, I was, I was involved in party politics yeah. for a while, and then um, after redistricting, you know, after some conversations, everything just fell into line, and, you know, I, I thought rural Colorado was worth fighting for, and yep. rural Colorado thought I was the right guy to send <laughs> up to do it, so uh, that's what I'm doing now, sir. Uh uh, you know, as well as raising kids and running a business and being a, a husband and father and a good family member, but no, and it's an honor to serve those constituents in 47. Yeah. And, um, you know, you got your first session under your belt and let me ask you this. So I, I think last time we were on, it was right after you got elected and we were kind of like, what's it like, you know, like going into this, never doing it before, but now looking back after your, your first rodeo with this, um, what do you think? Like, is it, about what you expected? Is it different? It's about what I expected. Um, you know, the job at first, it, it takes a while to learn. There's a learning curve. You know, yeah. when you when you decide to run, everybody you talk to that's either served or is serving is like, it's like drinking, you know, water out of a fire hose, which is an understatement. It's, yeah. it's way bigger than that. But once you get settled in, you know, I got settled in, you find a really good aide to help you out. That's very important as you find, you know, somebody that you can hire as a staff member to really help you out. That makes a big difference. But, you know, learning the process, learning the language when you speak, you know, in, in you know, some of the, the dynamics. And then, you know, what's really made it difficult for me is, is there was times that <clears throat> I would advocate for rural Colorado and mm-hmm. it would fall upon deaf ears. And that's what makes this job really hard is, is because there truly is a rural urban divide. And anybody yeah. that says that is either um, not being honest or they're, they're, you know, eyes wide shut type of thing. And people have to realize there is that divide in a way of thinking. <clears throat> what makes it hard though is, is the whole uh, mob rule mentality of we we carry the stick, you know, mm-hmm. we're going to use the big stick, and we know we have the big stick. And this country was founded on federalism. This country yep. was founded on, you know, they talk about flyover states mm-hmm. and things like that. And what people have to realize is, is the voices of rural Coloradans are important. You know, they talk about heritage. They talk mm-hmm. about all of these things. Well, we talk about those same things, and they're important to us, our way of life, mm-hmm. how we make our living, how we bring up our kids, what we teach them in school. So trying to get them to understand that, you know, the, th- the things that they're fighting for, we fight for the same things, and they're just as important. But since we're the minority party in rural Colorado mm-hmm. right now, um, that our voices are just as important. And that's the thing, I guess, that you know disappointed me the most was. Now, don't get me wrong. There was some times, I'm not saying there wasn't some things that did mm-hmm. get done bipartisan. There was some bills. You know, I passed uh, uh, along with some of my friends at the Capitol uh, eight pieces of legislation. Um, you know, I worked with, uh, you know, that's one nice thing is, you know, you do find some people in different uh, areas where they're passionate about something, and you may not agree on those hot button mm-hmm. topics, but, you know, we worked on a veterinary uh, a loan repayment, um, mm-hmm. expanding it to a couple more um, students and changing some of the language of it. And, you know, um, one of the uh, Democrats I worked with, she's a veterinarian, and it was a space we found we needed for rural Colorado, more large animal vets. We got that done. Um, don't get me wrong, that does happen at the Capitol, but it, it's it, – We've got to find a way for rural Colorado to have a stronger voice, not only in representation, but what return they see back from the Capitol. Yeah, and I've always said that, you know, when it comes to politics from the federal down to the local, that if you really want to make a difference, it's going to be local because 
you're more accountable to your constituents because you see them more, you know, you go to the grocery store, you go to church, you go wherever, and you see the people and you have that interaction. But I think even on the state level, when you get into some of the Denver area legislators, that they don't have that as much because there's just so many people. And for us rural folk, even though I live in Pueblo, which technically isn't rural, um, it's a little, it's a little different out here. Um, and you have that accountability. And I think that the rural, your rural constituents are a lot more passionate about these things that affect them and impact their lives. It seems like you get into that big city mentality and it's kind of day-to-day zombie, you know, nothing changes or affects me, but we feel it the the most out here, it seems like. Right, and I will say, you know, the parts of Pueblo, even Pueblo West that I represent, I always say when I represent rural Colorado, even in Pueblo West, they have rural values. It it still is rural Colorado. I think most of Pueblo is still rural Colorado. It's that small town feeling when you come to Pueblo. Um, But, you know, the thing about it is, is we tried to bridge that gap. I will say, you know, this summer, uh, myself, uh, Senator both Senator Peltons and Representative Holtorf, we did an Eastern Plains tour. Mm. Um, we invited people, we invited everybody. I put an invitation on the desk of every legislator in the House, and uh, Senator Pelton did in the Senate, and we invited, we ended up, I think it was have, it was between 11 and 16 came out. And, wow. um, you know, we had the assistant uh, majority leader came out. Um, we had, you know, some very prominent Democrats on Agriculture Committee come out, and they actually started a tour up near Sterling, and they saw a, a slaughterhouse, and they went to a sale barn, and then we took them down here in, um, <clears throat> in Lahana. You know, they talked to Knapps, and they talked to mm-hmm. Heracardas, and they talked to Hannigans, and they explained to them how the labor bill not only hurts them, but hurts the people that come to this country to work, they come here, they want to make money. They want to make as much money as they can, as fast as they can. They were even explaining how even the workers uh, are upset with it. So they had a good, and then they also, at at the end of the tour, they stopped at Evergreen in in Trinidad to see energy production and see how the produced water actually has created wetlands and it actually is used for wildlife and and farmers and ranchers for cattle instead of this whole thing around energy that, you know, the water that comes out of the ground is just poison. So we tried to give them a perspective. And point being is, is, I will say that myself and the rural legislators were honest brokers at the state capitol and a couple times on that tour they i heard them say some of the urban legislators wow you know it really is different out here and it's like well we've been telling you this for three months <laughs> that's you awesome. know? Yeah. but you know it, it was it was good so I, I do believe that we're trying to bring our point of view across uh, in a good way and then there's times we just have to dig in our heels and fight there's times you know you here's what it comes down to and you've been you've been involved in this a long time you know you can sit there and you can you, you know that old saying um, you can you know, lead a horse to water yeah. and you can try and you can try and then sometimes you just have to bear down your heels and if they're not listening you have to make them here for your constituents yeah. so uh, there's a lot of different ways to approach this and i think that uh, myself and the other rural legislators are doing everything we can for our constituents to make that difference to have their voices heard that's <clears throat> excuse me that's awesome uh you know one thing that i i also talk about you know this rural and urban divide um and at the same time i say well rural kind of has to do a better job of going to basically rural colorado has to do a better job of going to denver and kind of like fighting for that seat at the table um, now I, I, I think we do, and I think we always have, but at the, the same time, I think if we, and, and you're doing the right thing, that's perfect. You know, if we kind of come in a little more peaceful sometimes and bring them out and say, Hey, just come and look where we're coming from. And I appreciate that they actually did that. We're trying to set one up on the West slope with, uh, I think it was a farm bureau was looking to do something similar to what you did. And um, they're like, well, how do we get them out here? And I'm like, you got to kidnap them. Just kidnap them. Put them in a van and tell them you're going to Aspen or something. And then drive them out to the farms for three days. Like, we can't do that. I'm like, oh, I mean, technically you can't. But you know. Well, when you speak of rural and urban, this is something else I've been telling people. So, you know, at the national level, we see this, you know, total political ideology yeah. split, you know, Republican versus Democrat. But I tell people in 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 rural Colorado, it's not that split politically. It's more no. of a rural way of thinking versus an yep. urban way of thinking. You know, like in Los Animas County, perfect example. There's a lot of what we call Kennedy Democrats. Yeah. Democrats that love the flag, love capitalism, love their country, support their yep. military. And it's a different way. It's a more of conservative way of thinking. So what we're seeing is, and this is what I tell people all the time, if we're going to save our counties from unfunded mandates and we're going to save our cities from, um, losing control of how they build their houses, how they grow as communities goes back to what you said is local is the most important. And that's another thing I've been pitching is, is your most important races are your school board races and your yep. county commissioner, because those are the people that actually affect your everyday yep. life. 
we have to go ahead and we have to work together to tell, push back on the state and say, okay, on a certain level of politics, I agree with some of the stuff that is happening in Denver, but down here in Los Animas County, our bread and butter has been oil and gas and coal yeah. forever. And the policies that you're making at the Capitol, even though we may agree politically on some things, you're hurting my community. Yeah. And I think that's what we need to get more of. We need to start bearing down for rural Colorado and fighting because, I mean, we all have a lot of the same common goals, especially in rural Colorado. So we have to stop that and we have to actually start saying, okay, Political ideologies on some things we're never going to get together, kind of how it was in this country before. But now, guess what? We're fighting to preserve this. We're fighting to preserve our small communities for what they are, our faith, our value, our friends, what our kids learn in school, the, the, the aspects of life, hunting, fishing, agriculture. Those are just as important as what they're fighting to preserve at the state capitol or the belief system they have. And that's why we have to get our rural companions across all spectrums to sit down and say, okay, Lawmakers in Denver, governor in Denver, you've got to stop passing policies that hurt us. Electric vehicle tax credit bill, perfect example. That's a redistribution of wealth from rural Colorado to urban yeah. Colorado. If you look at per capita, how many people are going to get e-bikes in my district compared to Denver? And that's pulling money out of their district. We passed legislation against anti-gas, anti-oil, anti-energy. Yeah. Who does it hurt? It hurts the gas field in Los Animas yep. and Huerfano counties. I mean, your, your, your power plant here, who does yeah. it hurt? So the thing about it is, is we have to, as rural communities, put the squabbles aside and sit down and say, okay, we're going to advocate for our community and we're going to stand strong to keep our communities alive, well, vibrant, funded with tax dollars to take care of our, our citizens. And if you like that, you could go to action22.org and join Action 22, which is doing that thing. No, you're completely right. And that's another thing I've been saying that, you know, in rural where we kind of get caught up in our counties and our, our territory. And I think now we're seeing this more regional approach. So it's no longer, you know, Pueblo County versus Custer County on it fighting for stuff. And it's more regional. And, and interestingly enough, um, you know, a lot of the federal funding coming down or the, the administration stuff, they're putting that provision in there that this has to be regional, that, that you know, counties have to be aligned on the goals and stuff. And I, I, I agree with that. Rural Colorado, like, we really have to kind of get out of our little county bubbles or tiny bubbles where we're living and join with the other counties and communities around us. And that's what I love about southeastern Colorado is I actually yeah. see that with housing and everything. Yep. And like I tell people all the time, when I say this, it doesn't mean that we cave on our values. It doesn't yeah. mean that you cave on what you believe in. I mean, sir, I mean, here's the deal. I will advocate for this district, but there were certain things I ran on, and my constituents, when I when I put my platform out there, those are things that I will stick to those values yeah. all the time. I will stick to my, um, when it comes to being conservative with money and making sure taxpayers are getting the bang for their buck and making yeah. sure we're holding government accountable and trying to shrink government and, you know, uh, trying to open up freedom for everybody. My values have never changed there, but when it comes down to the meat and potatoes of saving our communities, when it doesn't come to those hot button issues, that's when we need to just get side to side and push back. And it's good to see that regional, and I see it yeah. in House District 47 all the time, yeah. and I give my cr- county commissioners credit because I'm not advocating just for my commissioners, but I have a great group of commissioners yeah. in House District 47, and it's unbelievable to see how they're starting to team up together. And that's the only way we're going to be able to do this because the, the front range and the Metroplex is a formidable opponent yeah, for rural it Colorado. Is. It, it is. is. I mean, it's a, it's a vote churning machine. I mean, that's where the population is. The contrast of lifestyles is so much different, but if we all work together, then we've got a chance in this fight. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. And, and I love doing the action 22, like our annual meeting coming up where we're, or even under board meetings, we'll sit there and you have, you know, somebody that's like super far right. And then somebody that's pretty far left and we're all agreeing on this stuff for Southern Colorado. And, and it's, you know, not to sound cheesy, but it's, it's like beautiful. It's like, we're in this together and yeah, we can beat each other later on the other things. I mean, that's going to happen. That's unavoidable. (laughs) Yeah. And if one of them always brings up like, well, Trump or abortion or Biden, and I'm like, okay guys, that that, just go to the parking lot for that part. Let's talk about funding for housing. (laughs) Right. And I think that's what we need to do is start centering the conversation back into what really matters, you know? And then sometimes we're having to have uncomfortable conversations, you know, going into this year, I really jumped into the mental health thing. Um, It was something that was on my radar, but when I got to the Capitol and I started to see how much it actually affected city budgets and medical facilities, and then it's just the right thing to do. And, you know, I was chatting with somebody the other day, and they're like, how do we fix the mental health issue? How do we fix the mental health issue? And, you know, being a country boy, being at the Capitol, I saw some things that blew my mind. I would call my wife and be like, babe, you know, I literally saw a gentleman wearing clothes made out of trash bags, screaming across the street at somebody that wasn't there. And the issue that I have is, is, I mean, 
mean, if we don't start having real conversations and people always say, you know, mental health involves everything, crime, yeah. safety, drug abuse. And I was chatting with a group of people and, you know, we have to have the hard conversations. And I finally said, you know, it's 2023. What I'm going to propose, we can do humanely. We can do with dignity. But what is, we have to start talking about institutionalizing the severely mentally ill. Mm -hmm. They need help. There is nothing humane about leaving them on the street wearing trash bags as clothing, freezing, um, hooked on drugs with no help, can't stay on their meds because they just can't be on their meds. This is a different country than it was 60 years ago. We can do this. And not only does it protect them, but more importantly, it protects the citizenry. Yeah. I saw families scared crossing the street in Denver at some of this stuff. I mean, that, that bus station down from the Capitol, as a grown man, I don't even want to walk Yeah, by. that's not. So, I mean, we start after to have these hard conversations, and I think that's what we need is we need people that are willing to sit down and do uncomfortable things, but part of that's going to be is, is we need to have people with armadillo backs, yeah. people that aren't afraid for the heat they're going to take because the wokeism is going to come in and say, how dare you say these things? But if we don't, if we keep caving to this, we can't have the hard conversations because people are going to come after us. Because when you're involved in this game, people are going to come after you for no matter what you say. Yeah. So we have to start having those true conversations. So we need we need true statesmen. We need true warriors that are going to step up and say, okay, we're going to have these uncomfortable conversations, and we're not going to cow- we're not going to cave to that squeaky wheel. We're not going to cave to this wokeism. We're going to use common sense, and we're gonna we're gonna be empathetic and we're going to use emotion in making our decisions, but we're not going to let emotion override common sense all the time. Yeah. And if somebody has a better idea, that's where you present it. Like, that's right. That's that, how you make the sausage. Yeah. I mean, that, that's really what it is. We're so afraid of having these conversations because, you know, we don't want to offend anybody or whatever, but that's the point. Like I have these ideas and maybe your ideas are completely opposite, but show me those ideas. And maybe that's how we get to consensus right. on how to fix this. There's a good chance when you lay it all out on the table, you draw a little bit from yeah. everybody's ideas and and that's how you end up with good policy. And nothing's worse than that just lockstep bootlicking. Yeah. This is the way it's going to be, and we're all going to jump on board. You can't have that. You have to have some dissent and some argument because that's how, essentially, I think the constituent and the citizen gets the best, um, not outlook, best result. Yeah, yeah. And it's going back to the, the kind of the homeless or unhoused or whatever the term is now, population. Um, we're having a mayor's race here in Pueblo. I think there's 12 candidates right now. Uh, Sarah gets the privilege of moderating that debate with all the candidates on stage. Um, I will not be there, and I'm thankful for that. <laughs> but, but you know, we're seeing – it's interesting because we had Randy Thurston on. He's running, and he has, he has some ideas. We've talked to other candidates and people with ideas – but other than Randy putting it on Facebook and talking about it, like everybody is so afraid. And I go to these meetings and you have the mental health side, you have the medical side, like physical, medical, you have the law enforcement side, you have the nonprofit side. It's like everybody's so afraid to say what they think the solution is. And I'll be one-on-one with all of them. And I, I work great with all those different groups. And, you know, they're like, well, this is what we should do. And I'm like, why didn't you say that when we just had a round table for two and a half hours talking about what can we do? The, the one thing that keeps coming up, and this, this pisses me off, it's like, well, we just need to have more funding to hire more people to study this more, to figure it out. I mean, it's the L.A. and San Francisco thing. It's like, you know, the, if your lawnmower is broke, do you just grab a wad of money and throw it at your lawnmower and yeah. it works? But that seems to be what they're doing now. Like, I, I, I mean, stop me if that's what I'm seeing. I don't know, like, how you feel about it, well, but it's... You know, and there's a lot of study bills I, I, you look at. Yeah. And it's like, hey, instead of putting money towards this study, let's put money towards a solution. I'm yeah. about solutions. I don't get me wrong. Not saying I, I signed on to a study bill because it's... There's some study bills yeah, that I mean, do there, need there, to be done. Go and get me there, wrong. There is a place and but time, but... Throwing assets and money at, 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 at full-time employees for study upon study, and you are right. What we need is we need people just to be like, I'm going to get in this foxhole with you, and I have your back. And there's... Nothing wrong with that. And yeah. it's, it's not being inhumane. It's not being not caring about people. I mean, to me, I look at somebody and just say, you know what? I want to get that person off the street in, like yeah. I say, a dignified, humane way is not a bad thing. I don't understand how somebody could think being humane is leaving them to wear trash bags screaming across the street in the freezing yeah. weather. And I, I mean, we have to start having these discussions. And, you know, it, and what's contributing to this? Yeah. I mean, 
you see these men you see on TV, oh, I, you know, I lost everything. Well, yeah. Inflation is contributing to this. Uh, what else is contributing to this? The cost of energy is contributing to this. Yep. Everything is costing Americans more. I mean, you know, everybody talks about cattle prices now. Oh, they're the highest they've ever been, but the inputs are also the highest they've ever yeah, been. Yeah. So, you know, what is driving society to this? What I mean, is it part of mental health? And that's another discussion we need to start having is, is we need to start having discussion about actually surviving or are we trying to meet pie in the sky goals and agendas without looking at the consequences? And are we doing it too fast? And that's some other conversations that need to be have around our energy sector, around the way we grow government. I mean, come to find out in the state of Colorado, correct me if I'm wrong, but the report just came out and the two sectors of employment Mm -hmm. or jobs that grew in this state one was government and two was the travel or hospitality industry and those jobs were just jobs that come back from covid shutdown yeah so i mean we're growing government so i I don't know i I think we just have to find just that healthy balance and we just have to start having the hard discussions and we have to start saying these are the results i mean you we're seeing results of legislation now we're seeing results look at the streets look at crime Mm -hmm. you have da's you have sheriffs you have prosecutors you have Law enforcement going, we can't do our job. Yep. I mean, so, I mean, crime is on the rise in Colorado. Everything, I mean, we're starting to see the results of legislation. Now what we need to do is to say, okay, you tried it your way. Now we're going to have the hard conversation. We're going to quit looking at this through a certain lens, and we're going to lay all the cards, like you said, out on the table, and we're going to actually try to fix this problem instead of throwing money on it and add an FTEs and yeah. um, add an organizations and actually get our hands dirty do the hard thing and get it fixed. And I think that's what we, I mean, you know this as well. You've been involved a long time. Uh, government's uh, uh, notorious and nefarious for not doing either. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I'm, I'm working with my, my mother-in-law. She's trying to get her Social Security. She's turning 67. And she's like, oh, my God. She's like, I have to call again and sign this paper, and they keep doing this? And I'm like, welcome to the government. Anytime you do it to government, talk to anybody that goes to the VA, anybody that goes to Social Security. Um, and now with the state, it's turning into that. Like the, the state of Colorado's turned into this giant bureaucratic machine, it seems like. You know who's More so than it? ever. The counties. Yep. You and I, the yep. counties. And it's taken services away from our constituents because the county has to come up. I mean, then, uh, I mean, we've got this whole Prop HH thing going on, which yep. I'm talking to my assessor, which is saying that they're going to have to hire more people, but they couldn't add more people in their office because of wages. So I just, you know, you're right. I mean, we're, it's just we're seeing an overbearing amount of stuff, yeah. and people don't realize that there's a lot of do-gooding that goes on at the Capitol, yeah. and you can survive in Adams County, Jeff Co., Doug Co., but when you get out back, back of Bent Prowers, I mean, you get out in these little counties, they just don't have the tax dollars coming in to um, keep up with all the demands that state government puts on them through do-good legislation. And, and to top it off, as, you, as the state is transitioning away from oil and gas into renewable energies, which I'm not opposed to renewable energies. We've, we, we've had people on, you know, from all sides of this, but one thing that nobody's paying attention to is that the, the tax base, like from everything from property tax to all this stuff is going to go away. And then the tax generated, the tax revenue from say a solar field is like, I think it's like 4% of say Comanche power plant, even though it's just as large. And so you're going to see the counties taking a big hit on this as well. I mean, that's the fight in Pueblo. We've, you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse on this, but that's no, and that's right now. No, that's the fight everywhere, and that's that, that's what makes this hardest. So, I mean, you can unpackage the en- energy deal, you know, all at once. I mean, it's a yeah. wet blanket on not only the national economy but our economy. I mean, we're seeing the cost of everything go through the roof when it comes to energy. So, first of all, to unpack that is is the discussions that we always have is is okay. You know, how many metric tons of coal does it take to make solar panels? How many metric tons of coal does yeah. it take to make these wind generators? And we we just want to have real conversations. We want to have real conversations with people. And I agree with you. I'm an all that I'm an all energy portfolio mm-hmm. kind of guy. I think we should have coal, oil, and gas, a mixture of wind, solar. Um, I'm all, you know, and I will. I'm an advocate. I have no problem saying this. I believe in small modular nuclear reactors. I think that that's something that if you know <clears throat> if the people on the side of uh, climate change and they want to have this discussion about saving the planet, well, if we're talking about true carbon free energy. You can't discount small modular nuclear. I mean, thorium reactors, they're actually burning nuclear waste. It's the thing of the future. Um, And if we're going to actually have a firm power grid, they talk about climate change. Well, what if the wind quits blowing? Um, What if the sun comes out intermittently? I mean, are we going to go back to the Stone Ages? And I think think nuclear, especially as safe as it is now, and is compact as the plants are, I think that's an option. But it's having those discussions, and it's like, are you really – 
worried about carbon free? Are you really worried about keeping the lights on or is this a political agenda? So the whole energy thing is crazy. And then you're right. I mean, so I ran a bill on severance tax, uh, uh, Mm -hmm. came out with some commissioners and basically what it was going to allow was his counties that pay severance tax. They get 60% right back off the top for the looming shutdown because we know the office of unjust, I call it unjust transition. Um, So this is the way I look at it is if the state politics in Denver are going to shut our industries down, then they should give us this money while we're making it to, and it was earmarked for schools, roads, uh, infrastructure, and any type of like hospitals or medical. In committee hearing, when they shot this bill down, they looked at me and they're like, well, do you know how much money that's going to take from us and the state and projects? And I'm like, okay, that's why I ran the bill because I knew you were going to shoot it down. But the point is, is you're literally slitting the throat of your golden calf. And it's just crazy to see. So it's, it's having the real conversations that aren't just, you know, on a Monday at the Capitol, we're fighting from one position, but on Tuesday we're fighting from the other position. So when it comes to energy, we got to have real conversations and we have to, we have to look at how can we reach these benchmarks? If this is the way the state's going, Let's make sure we can reach them. Are they attainable years? Are the goals attainable? Or are we going to find ourselves in a mess? Um, Mm -hmm. So I think having those conversations are real. They can't be one-sided conversations. Yeah, and initially it started out, the goals were attainable when we did this whole transition to green and um, energy and cutting carbon. Like, I mean, the goals were modest. It was, you know, 2060, 2050. But then you just saw every year it was like, oh, no, 20. 35 20, now it's like 2032 it just rolls they just keep pushing right. it more and and a lot of the producers energy producers here like they met those goals they met it ahead of time you know for the initial and then they're like oh you could do that so let's push it you know further right. further um and, and ironically the biden administration supports nuclear the, you know the department of energy is really pushing nuclear power and we had a meeting i think it was with the undersecretary of energy or something they, they came to pueblo a few years ago um, to talk about the SMRs, and this was right before COVID. And, uh, you know, it, it was really kind of humorous because the Pueblo Democrat platform is no nuclear Pueblo. Like, that's one of their, I think it's one of their party platforms, or there is a group called No Nuclear Pueblo. And, you know, just the confusion when they're like, wait a minute, you know, like, yes, we, you know, we supported Joe Biden, President Biden, blah, blah, blah. And then the administration comes like, you guys should look into nuclear. And it was, um, an interesting reaction in the, the crowd when they said that. Well, and when I ran the bill, it was really crazy to see because the boomers that t- were there to testify against it, but to see the college kids and the high school kids yeah. that came and testified in favor. I mean, I was getting calls from University of Tennessee. Kids yeah. were like, you know, thanks, Rep. Winter, for running something like this. This is the way we're going to save America. This is the way we're going to stay industrialized um, with, with what's going on. No, and you're right. And, and here's the thing about it is, is, is I, I, I mean – this is a perfect area. This is a perfect yeah. area of transmission. You know, that it's a lot of these places, four to 600 good, you know, blue collar, you know, high paying jobs. The problem I have with all of this, when we talk about this is when we're talking about the climate, you know, I'm no expert by any of this, but I've done my research and I know that India and China pump enough oh, um, yeah. into the atmosphere that everything yeah. we do doesn't change a darn thing. So it makes it hard for me is, is like you look at Pueblo, proud steel town. There is no reason in the United States of America that we shouldn't be making our own steel that we shouldn't be producing our, I mean, I know we do some of our own rail and things like that, but we should be a non-buying community. Yeah. I mean, we have the ability, we have the resources and we can do it cleaner. Yeah. I literally was in a conversation one time and I, w- I told a lady, I'm like, so I've done some research and like, you know, the coal plant, the scrubbers, they take 90% of the toxins out of the air. And I'm like, you know, they're not doing this in China. You yeah. know, they're not doing this in India. So if our goal is, is to really save the climate, then why aren't we, doing this here? Why are we allowing them to do it dirty? Why are we shipping jobs overseas? Why are we yep. shipping wealth overseas? Why aren't we becoming more of a, pro- a, pro- a production nation? We learned under COVID that we rely way too much on the rest of the world. And she basically said, well, I don't have to see it. It's out of sight, out of mind. Well, that don't solve problems in America. You want to out of sight, out of mind, don't put meat and potatoes and corn on, on the, yep. the table when you're feeding your kids. And it almost feels like now as Americans with everything that's going on in Ukraine and everywhere, it's almost like the government sets a table of food, okay, mm-hmm. and you've got America all standing around the table ready to eat, and then they're letting everybody else come down and sit at the table where you eat. That would be no different than me cooking dinner and having my kids stand to the side and then letting the neighbor kids eat. Yeah. Well, they sat there, and I just don't understand why we are literally effectively shutting down the industry, yeah. getting rid of good blue-collar jobs, 
when we're not holding anybody else to these expectations. Yeah. And it just makes it hard. It makes it hard because I see the struggle. I've seen Main Street in my district dry up. I see. I saw the population of Trinidad drop you know, quite a bit when 181 was passed because all those guys had to go to Texas, Oklahoma, North mm-hmm. Dakota that are friendly to oil and gas and tear families apart. And I've seen this. And at the end of the day, rural Colorado, we're the true stewards of the land. Yeah. Our water's blue. Our skies are clear. Our grass is green. We, lo- we love the land. We, we nurture the land. It takes care of us. We take care of it. So when they preach to us about climate change and we don't care and, the, and we're deniers and this and that, that isn't even in the argument. The argument is, is, is you can work to save the climate if that's your main goal, but let's not slit the throat of America and let's make sure that families can feed their families. And, yeah. and that's my big thing is, is I, you know, I, I want us to see us in Colorado, you know, I'll push for it. You know, up at the Capitol, we were, there was a whole electric vehicle fight. I won't get into it. And part of my argument was, is, is well, instead of getting these batteries from overseas, if, if you're going to do this, why don't you make Colorado the first place to use batteries that don't have certain materials? in? Yeah. It? Let's create the industry here. I mean, let's, let's put people to work instead of outsourcing everything overseas. Yeah. So if your goal is to do this, get Americans to make the money to build the product again. And that's where I think another thing we need to start pushing and fighting back. We can't do much at the state level on the national level, but we can start holding the state yeah. accountable for making sure that, that if we're going to take jobs from oil and gas workers, that they've got high paying jobs to go into. Yeah. And not to mention that, you know, the revenue that the state generates, which I hate saying that the state, the government generates revenue, but you know, the the revenue that powers the state and funds the state is one and two is ag and oil and gas. And it's so funny. It's like, what do you guys think is going to happen when you start cutting this away? Like, that's right. I just had a meeting um, and it was with department of energy. It was an update and they went through agriculture. And the first thing is uh, reducing methane. Where is that going to go? Yeah. Who knows? I mean, over a European year and a union, um, I can't remember what country had to, they have to slaughter 350,000 head of dairy cattle to meet European Union methane I goals. Know. So, I mean, where is this going to go? Is it, I mean, are ranchers and farmers going to actually, you know, the joke used to be, you know, pay for cow flatulence. Is that actually what we're seeing when you see that number one on the list of their goals for agriculture and reducing greenhouse gases? Yeah. I mean, it really makes you wonder. And you're right. I just don't understand. You know, we had the whole meat out day. And I mean, Helen Kessler being the veterinarian who actually ends up <laughs> abusing animals that she advocates yeah, for. That was, a, <laughs> that was a weird turn of events. I mean, you talk <laughs> about like point the finger back at yourself. So, I mean, and then just, you know, the reintroduction of the wolf and then not allowing, you know, us to be able to dispatch the wolf. Yeah. If it's, I mean, it's it, it just seems like agriculture. And I hear that throughout the district. People are frustrated. Yeah. And they just don't realize this. I mean, literally, the governor vetoes the only way for a farmer or a rancher to protect his livestock or his guardian dogs. And it's just like almost every move made at the Capitol is, a, is literally just a shot fired at, at agriculture, which is rural Colorado. Yeah, and even if they don't mean it that way, it looks that way to us. I, I, you know, it'd be like... You're right. It's like a shot fired. It's like, say, your neighbor's out shooting and a bullet hits your house. It right. seems like that person's shooting at your house. You well, know? One of those old country saying, the proof is in the pudding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so okay, so I'm pissed. It's like, this is what's really got me. And this even goes back to mental health. So it is so expensive to live right now. Um, like I, I was telling you earlier, I make good money. I make more money than I made six years ago. And I have less money. Everything, like literally everything from my property tax to the groceries to gas, everything is so expensive and nobody wants to take accountability for it at all. I've not heard one person say like, you know what, you guys are suffering right now because we did this. Sorry. Like not even like, but it'll get us to a better place. Like, and that goes back to the mental health because I see people going to, my wife's a realtor and there's so many people that are like, we have to sell our house and move into a cheaper, like crappier house. And just the stress level this is putting on my friends, even my marriage, you know, it's like we're broke. Like we're living paycheck to paycheck right now and we make good money. And I know there's a lot of people that don't make as much money as us. What do we do? Like, and, and again, even, even the mental health aspect, like, you know, I, I'm a pretty happy and cheery guy and I don't let a lot get to me, but I, I get paid and I pay my bills and we're just all in a bad mood all the time. And that's not good. And that's not healthy for us. That's not healthy for our kids. That's not healthy for society. Like, what do we do? Like, how do we stop this? You know, (laughs) 
that's a you know and that's a, a, that's <laughs> I mean it's more of a rhetorical no, you're question. Right. No, and that's a big pa- that's a big question to unpack. And and first of all is is what we talked about earlier is looking at policy that isn't working yeah. and quit throwing more money at it or you know quit trying to prop up something based upon well you know I really like this idea and I'm going to will it to work even though it won't work. And yeah. I think we see that a lot in legislation what we happen in this country. But you're right. I mean you know my wife the other night she's like literally this is all I got for three hundred and seventy five dollars at the store. Um, our kids uh, go to school at a little school which is about 30 minutes from our house we watch my daughter actually play volleyball an hour from our house that's her homeschool gym and i mean we drive there two three times a week at gas at four dollars a gallon and but we shoot ourselves in the own foot i mean our own foot all the time i mean we shut down the pipelines we quit you know drilling domestically then we rely on the middle eastern countries for oil so when it comes to that whole thing with energy that just blows my mind yeah and i mean in what you said right now um Oliver Anthony, the rich man in Richmond. I mean, you're literally, that's why that song blew up because he's telling the story of people on all sides of the aisle, all political spectrum. He's literally telling the story of America. Yeah. I mean, literally, I mean, you unpackage that st- song from top to bottom. And that's why there was such, I mean, there was guys on TikTok saying this song made me cry. I've never had such yeah. a visceral reaction. And you're right. Things are tough on people and it does affect mental health. I mean, when it, you just can't stretch that money enough, then you can't have any fun. You know, you're yep. working your tail off, and you're literally eating it, and you're, you know, you're washing it, and you, you can't, you can't go anywhere. You can't, can't take your kids anywhere. I mean, that's that's tough when you really work hard. So, uh, you know, it's going to take a lot of different things, and I, but a lot of it's going to take people looking themselves in the mirror, and then a lot of it's going to take is asking hard questions like we talked before, like why are you doing this? Yeah. Show me the end goal because what I'm seeing right now isn't working for me now, now show me. And I think that, you know, elections have consequences. And that's another thing I'm going to say. And we say it all the time. Elections have consequences. And people need to start looking at candidates and they need to start just quit looking at names and who their dad and their mom was. Start looking at their policies. Start asking them, you're talking about all the problems. What are you going to do to fix these problems? And start electing candidates that are going to actually do something. And, you know, what I'm hoping in the state of Colorado is with some of the legislation we've seen and some of the results, the citizenry is going to look and say, you know what, okay, you know, I may have subscribed or bought into this for a while, but I'm not seeing any results. Now we've got to have some kind of change. So until we see a change politically, honestly, Mm -hmm. in certain things, I don't think, you know, we're going to see, you know, we went from seeing an economy that was flying through the charts. And of course, you know, we can call COVID the wet blanket, whatever it is. But, you know, we saw how things were just a short time ago and you know it it could be that way again when you're out there talking to people do you see that shift right now because i i do i do quite a bit i more now than i ever have but um but are you seeing that that the average vote like the uninformed voter saying you know this isn't really working maybe i should start paying attention to this and think different about it you know, for me, it's really crazy because you understand everywhere I go usually are your most informed voters, it yeah. seems like. I do talk to a lot of people on the street, and there are some people that don't, you know, there was somebody the other day that, you know, we had a conversation, and I know how they believe, and yeah. when I told them some information, they were just shocked. They were like, really, that's why this happened? And I'm like, yeah, look it up. They looked up, they're like, wow, I didn't know that. So, you know, I think that they're starting to open their eyes a little bit because, you know, things are hard enough now where people yeah. are asking hard questions. I see it a little bit, you know, and it, and it gives me hope. It gives me hope. And it's not for any type of ideological fight. It gives me hope that we're going to pull this thing back on the tracks because one thing that we forget is, is you know, um, Nowadays, we're scholars of everything but history. We yeah, want to I forget know. history. I know. And, you know, history is, you know, the saying isn't around for nothing, repeats itself. And we're starting to see some signs and symptoms in this country and in this state um, of, you know, how things can end up. And, you know, I truly hope that, you know, at some point, um, I'm not saying that the electorate should vote for bad candidates on, you know, but yeah. hopefully the the electorate starts to see through some, wade through some of the stuff, uh, starts uh, hearing instead of listening. And, you know, ho- hopefully, you know, a guy like myself can do a lot better job of reining people in on my side and saying, okay, here's the deal. Here's the problems that we have. Here's some solutions that we have. Now, are you behind me and are you with me and are we going to try to make a difference? So, um, you know, I hope that, you know, uh, 
uh, my other colleagues are doing the same, which I think they are. I see that a lot in rural Colorado, and I, you know, I see that a lot out of the mighty 19 that I serve with. And, you know, we just need to stay uh, principled. Mm-hmm. Um, we need to hold to our values, and we need to start. I mean, well, not we need to start, sorry. We need to continue um, being the adults in the room and having real good, hard conversations because I think at some point um, the people of Colorado are going to look and say, okay, you know, they're having some hard conversations, but they're really getting their hands dirty trying to fix the problems. And then on the other side, uh, that's all I would ask out of my uh, legislator or all I ever have is before I was an elected official is, is you know what, just get your hands dirty and, and try to make a difference. I, I would like to see a bill passed, which it'll never be introduced or passed, that would require any legislator that is passing, sponsoring, voting on a bill that impacts a certain industry, any industry, go spend a week in that industry <laughs> to see how it really works. Right. You know, and that was part of the egg tour is so a ranching yeah. family can look at you and say, hey, you did this and this is what it did to me. And you're right. I, I think I think that's huge. Yeah, that would be one we were talking about, you know, how much you get paid doing this and how it's a part time job. But you're, you know, you're working more than full time doing it. I'd be like, yeah, I'd be willing to raise the salary to a decent full time salary if on your off time that you were able to go into all these industries like in the summer and go, hey, you know what? I want to do something that impacts law enforcement, you know, defund the police or fund the police, whatever. Well, you're going to have to go do a ride along for a week with police departments and see how this really works or go work on a farm for a week. Oh, well, you're, you're a hundred percent correct. Yeah. And I think that would be awesome. I don't think that it happened. There's, yeah, it'll never there's happen. a lot of, there's a lot of hands in that capital who never seen the shovel. Yeah, <laughs> I I, I know. Um, but no, I, and I think that that's part of telling that story. And that's yeah. what I always tell people, you know, the only thing that came out of COVID at the Capitol that was good was the al- allowance of remote testing. Yeah. That, oh, trust me. Cause that's... that was a real equalizer for my district. Yeah. Now don't get me wrong. Are we um, less equal when it comes to the availability to broadband or whatever, but you know, it's still in rural Colorado. There's yeah. going to be a library or a school where you can get in and do your civic duty. And I, I tell everybody, please, you know, is, I've got a really good aid this year. I hired, um, I think we're going to be a great team and I think I'm going to be able to pump a lot more information, but please, I I tell people everywhere I go, watch the legislative website, write down the bills you don't like to see, um, stay in touch with me, get on there and testify. They need to hear your voices because that's one thing that a lot of people do a good job up there. You know, they have this policy that only, you know, this one size fits all policy out of Denver. That's another thing I preach about constantly is this one size fits all, but they just parade people through just, I mean, one night I sat on the housing committee from, I think it was three in the afternoon till two in the morning, just one after another. You've seen it. You I, I was it. on that. Like, okay. I mean, Sarah, that's right. That, that saved us. I'm like, we would have had to been up there till two in the morning, like three that's times right. a week. I'm like, yeah, no. So but, that's important that people realize that, you know, they, they need to, they need to get on there and air their grievances. To well, and, and, and um, doing our leadership Academy, they didn't realize you can do that. Like most people don't like, there's somebody upstairs. They're like, well, how do we, you know, comment on this. And I'm like, here, I'll show you, go to this website. This is what you do. And now they're on it like all the time, <laughs> you know, they right. were like every night trying to comment on stuff that impacts them. And, you know, it's hard. And, you know, there's a lot of legislation that, that, that gets passed that, you know, people don't, um, essentially that I always say the devil's in the details yeah. of the legislation. You know, I, I'm a rural Colorado kid and I voted against the right to repair bill because there yeah. was so many unanswered questions. And what makes it really crazy and what makes it hard is, is, you have people that want to pass good legislation and do good work. And at the end of the day, even if I don't write a bill, every time I press that red or that green button, I'm subscribing my name and, and not yep. only my name, but my district's voice to it. So, you know, after talking to numerous groups of people, we came up with about five hard questions to ask about it. And until they were answered, you know, the Farm Bureau, there was a federal MOU that, yep. that was proposed. And we were like, hey, pump the brakes on this. Let's take a year. Let's let's make sure that this don't affect warranty work out of state. Because in my district, a lot of those guys buy egg equipment in Nebraska, Kansas, yeah. New Mexico, over on the western slope, Utah. So if you work on it here and then you take it back for warranty work, how is that going to affect? How is it going to affect emissions standards and what's it going to cost on a trade-in? What's it going to do to your parts houses in rural Colorado that employ, you know, yeah. uh, and come to find out you could already buy the software. There was a lot of things. Well, we said, hey, let's pump the brakes on this. And it was, no, we got to get it through. Um, you know, and that's another thing that, you know, talk about what I learned at the Capitol this year is, is we we do a lot of fixing of bills that were passed previously. And I think, first of all, five bills a piece is way too many. Yeah, I think it's um, I think more. Representative Luck, maybe if I'm correct, she tried to run a bill to reduce it to three. I don't think it made out of the committee. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm pretty sure it was Representative Luck. Um, so, you know, it's high 
speed, fast paced. You're writing your bills. You're seeing bills in committee. You're voting on 600 and some bills. And then we wonder why we passed shoddy legislation. So I think we need to dig more in point being into the devil, the details in this bill, such as the, the right to repair bill. And we need to start really doing good stakeholder groundwork. I'm working on a piece of legislation now, and I don't want to break it out, but I've already got with all the groups and said, hey, I don't want to get too excited because this might be two years. I said, I'm running again. I'm going to work my tail off. I'm going to get reelected. And, and, and if we're going to keep working on this bill, because if we don't get it done, I'm not going to put something out yeah. there that isn't right. So I wish uh, that you know we could do a little bit more of that. And I think that that would also make a difference on how these bills are affecting people, yeah. affecting wages, affecting energy. I think if we just put a little more time into it. Yeah. Well, I got to get you to your next meeting. So, oh man, I uh, hope I didn't talk too much. No, no, no. It's fun. it's perfect. We always like having you on. So, I- anytime. I I think um, one final thought. There is kind of a media and information desert in Southern Colorado right now. We had we used to have the ch- the chieftain, and they're the chieftain, so they're not the big powerhouse they used to be. And I, I think that you know we really want to take this show and podcast and kind of blow it up and make it more of an information site specifically when it comes to this legislation to get people to to um, the info they need when it comes to supporting voting for or against like HH is a big one. We're going to have both sides of that on and go in depth on that. Um, but I, I think we really need to, again, get together regionally in Southern Colorado and have some source of, I don't want to call it the news because we're not reporters, but just a good information hub on a lot of this stuff coming up so people can have that. No, and you're, you're correct. You know, you're correct by saying news because in this country you used to have news and you used to have opinion and now it's been blurred. Yeah. As long as it, and I think you guys do a good job of that. And no, I think it is a good idea. And I, you know, I think another thing is, is it's getting with regional news outlets because yeah. there are little Facebook pages because I yeah. have them throughout the district and, you know, they will pump that information. And we are, you know, that's why, you know, at this, our Lincoln Day dinner last Saturday, you know, up at the Capitol, you hear about food deserts and you hear about all these different issues they have in the city. And I'm like, if you don't think it's not magnified by a thousand, I mean, you're mad because there isn't a Trader's Joe's down the street, four <laughs> blocks. You know yeah. what I'm trying? I'm like, yeah. and some people are driving an hour and a half to get groceries or gas. So you are right. We are in a day. We are at a lack of a lot of things in rural Colorado. And one of them is, is getting information yes. out, you know, because there's a lot of people in my district that still don't use email and they still don't have Facebook and they don't have Twitter. And are they, is that number shrinking? Yeah, of course it is. But I think, you know, I think that still, I always tell people in my district, newspapers, mailers, they're still all important because a lot of people, that's how they get their information. You know, I've showed up to events and people be like, did you see this in the paper? Or I got this in the mail. So, you know, but we do, you're right. And I try to do that as well. Just so you know, as an, I try to be a good, you know, faithful, honest broker. I try to go out and tell people, here's the deal. You know, this is, it is for what it is. This is what I have it on. Do do your own research, see what you think. Um, You know, I've been trying to, I wrote a prop HH Mm -hmm. op-ed. I think it even hit one of the, I sent it to the chief and I don't know if it, but I know it was printed in quite a few. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it somewhere. So okay, yeah. So you know, I, and and it's just informing people and saying, you know, this is what it is. This is what I believe. Uh, do your own research. So you know, I think we need to do a consorted effort, elected officials, Action Twenty Two, and getting with little news outlets, whether they be just a little town Facebook chatter page. Yeah, you, know, just, you get somebody that gets on there from your organization and shares it into a Trinidad Chatter or you know a La Junta local news. Yeah, but we need to do a get a better job of getting our citizens involved. And I know in rural Colorado it's tough. I know in small town America it's tough because the mom that's on the school board is also on her political committee in the county yep. who's also the dance instructor mom who probably drives the bus and the dad's the rancher who coaches football who's on the school board. So I get all of that. And I and I know rural Coloradans because being involved in politics, you know, a lot of people are like, you know what, we, we, we vote, we're really active, we just don't have the time to do this. Yeah. And I understand that. So it's getting that person the information that, that's on the go with their kids. Yep, exactly. Um, so I, you're right. I think we need to do a better job and, you know, like anything I can ever do to help, you know, Um, help you get you know the message out for action 22 you're always welcome anytime i travel or have a town hall or anything if somebody wants to come along and at least say this is who we are and this is what we do i mean you advocate for 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 my district so you're always welcome along and we'll try to spread that word out there appreciate it if anybody wants to know more about you or follow you where they go um representative ty winner on facebook 
Um, you can you look me up. I have a website online. Uh, it, you know, it kind of has an, I, a little bit of what I did last session and, and what I plan on doing. Um, I've said it a few different places, but I've announced to run again. I, I've officially announced there will be a press release coming out. And, you know, I'm just going to continue to be that fighter for 47. I'm going to keep talking con- constituents. I'm going to go up there. Um, I'm going to fight like heck for the, the beliefs and the value system of rural Colorado. And I'm going to... And at the end of the day, I'm going to get things done for all constituents of House District 47. So, you know, please uh, go to the website, uh, check out my Facebook page. Um, You can see what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, thank you for having me on. I appreciate your time. And, you know, uh, thanks for having some of these good, candid conversations where we can really dig down in deep and and talk about some of those touch point issues. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you coming on. Um, I think this is your third time on. Second or third. Or second or third. Second yeah, or I can't third. remember. Um, okay, so now i got to do the disclaimer since you said you're running. <laughs> <laughs> so Action 22 and making action happen, neither endorse or support candidates, but we do support our members. So if you're a candidate running for office or wanting to run for office and a member of Action 22, you have an open invitation to come on our show and, and tell us what you're about and your platform. Also, the views and opinions expressed on making action happen do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Action 22, its board, or its membership. Um, um, again, October 5th and 6th, annual meeting. Go to action22.org. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, you want to talk smack to me, um, show at action22.org. Send me an email. Thank you.